worthy Lord and so we come before you this afternoon with a desire with a hunger with a thirst after you we come before you Lord that you will fill us up again we come before you Lord that you will speak to us that you will encourage us Lord many of us have needs that are feeble but we come to you this afternoon that Lord you will strengthen our feeble knees for many of us that are discouraged Lord we run to you for encouragement for many Many of us that are feeling blown from every side, Lord, your word tells us that you are a strong tower and the rushes run unto you and they are safe. So, Lord, we come before you this afternoon. We come before you, Lord, that you will speak to us, that you will rebuke us, that you will teach us, that you will remind us of what your word says to us. And so, Lord, we pray that you bless us with your presence, that as you open your word in these few minutes, Lord, the glory and honor will come back to you. Give us an understanding of what it means for us to be disciples. Disciples sold after your own heart. Disciples given to loving you and serving you. Disciples that have dedicated our lives to you. And so Lord we ask that you will come and speak to us. We ask that you will have your way among us. We ask Lord that you will take your place. Be exalted, be glorified as we sit at your feet. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord is good all the time. God is good and that is his nature. I want to thank you so much for tiring in the presence of God. Thank you for not giving up the habit of fellowship like many do, but thank you for holding on to uh, wanting to come and be in the presence of God. Friends, this afternoon we have a reflection from Luke chapter 14, verses 25 to the end. Luke chapter 14, beginning to read at verse 25. And this is what it says in my Bible, the NIV version. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said... If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciples. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure heap. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Friends, this is the word of God. Now, this is a familiar passage that many times we go through, and yet every time I personally read it, there is some freshness that comes to mind. But as you begin to interact with the beginning passages, Jesus seizes the opportunity to make sure that his word comes across. 
Many times when we have crowds around us, when we have crowds around us, we seemingly do not pause and say, you know what, this is an opportunity for me to declare the mysteries of God. But as crowds follow Jesus, he is aware that some of them are actually following him, probably because of peer pressure, some are simply following because it is exciting. Some are simply following because they have been waiting for a king to come that will help, uh, help them get rid of the Roman people that are ruling them. And so they feel it is cool to go with this king, follow him. Probably when things are well and he has settled in his kingdom, probably we will be among those to have a share in his kingdom. And so Jesus is aware of the many intentions in the hearts of men, of those that were following him, seizes the opportunity and says, you know what, let me teach you what it exactly means for one to be my follower, for one to be my disciple. And so verse 25 tells us they were traveling with him, following him, and he turns to them and he begins to teach them what it means to be a disciple. And that is why he starts in verse 26. But if you read 26 out of context, it is possible for one to say, it is as if Jesus is beginning war with someone's loved ones, with someone's family. Because it says in 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters... It is as if, friends, Jesus is telling the people around him, the crowds, that the first qualification for, for you to be called my disciples, there must be evidence of hate for your families. And this is something difficult to take in. Friends, as I read this passage, the kind of words that Jesus uses are very eye-catching and at times frightening. But it is not what it appears to be in text. Jesus is not saying for you to qualify to be my followers, you must hate your mother, you must hate your children. He is using hyperbole. Now this kind of language, hyperbole is when someone uses radical language to communicate a particular point. It is kind of an exaggeration. He is using exaggerated language to help these people understand the depth of the matter. Jesus has used this before. It should not surprise us. Remember when he was telling us about the things that bring us to sin? He said, you know what? If your right eye causes you to sin, gorge it out. If your right, right hand causes you to sin, Cut it off. Friends, Jesus was not ordering us to move about dismembering members of our bodies. That is not what he was literally meaning. He is using exaggerated radical language to help us understand that for us to deal with sin, we have to be that radical, praise the Lord. And so when he says to these people, for you to be a disciple, my follower, you have to hate your family, he is causing us to pause and reflect. You know, family means a lot to us. For many of us without families, we do not know how life would be. There is a point in our lives where there is that devotion to our families. Family is everything. So Jesus is indirectly telling us that the love we have for our families should not supersede the love that we ought to have for him by comparison. He is indirectly saying that as a follower of Jesus Christ, no love in your life should eclipse your love for him. In fact, if you are to put your love for your family on a weighing scale vis-a-vis -vis your love for him, the love for him should be above it. So much so that comparison would be called hate for your family. Not that he's calling you to literally hate your family members. 
Now, Jesus here mentions for us two categories of re relationships that he wants us to reflect about as people that are following him. Of course, the first one is that relationship with our families, father, mother, brother, sisters, wives, and children, and he's telling us our love for him should supersede the love for families. Now, this is not a call for us to minimize or to diminish the special bond that we have with our family members, but Jesus knows it is very demanding. There is devotion required of us for our family members that many times for some of us, family becomes an idol. Family for many of us becomes an excuse for not fulfilling that that he wants us to fulfill, especially the call over our lives. And there is a famous pastor in town who sings, and one time in one of his songs he sang and said, this sister came before the Lord, prayed for a husband, the Lord gave her a husband, they got children, and now the children have come, the, she no longer brings tithe to God because she says, you know what, God, my baby cannot afford to take black tea, she need, my baby needs milk, and then in that, I, I think you know that, Pastor, most of his songs are kind of story-like. And then he talks about a brother who prayed for a car. The Lord gave him a white car. And because the car is white, he can't carry passengers that have dirty shoes. Praise the Lord. Hey, those are the songs Pastor Bugembe sings. And they have meaning. As you reflect, for many of us, family at times can become an idol. And so Jesus is reminding us, as followers of Jesus Christ, the call for us is to love him so much so that people around us, in comparison with the love we have for our family members, will find that we indeed love Jesus more. The question he is indirectly posing in this passage is, who is in control of your life? Is it your family? Is it your wife? Or is it other people? The call is for him to be Lord. A disciple has a master. A disciple is a servant that serves the Lord, the master. And so the call is for us to be disciples. We ought to acknowledge his lordship by loving him more than anything else in our lives. You know, we live in families and many times we, we do certain things to please the people in our families. As a wife, there are, there are days I wake up and I really want to please my husband. And I will do all it takes. I will prepare nice food. I will speak good words that day. I, 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 we usually want to please the people in our families. But many times we do not pause and ask ourselves, what is it that I must do as a follower of Jesus Christ to please him? What is it that I must do? And that is to love him and not letting the love we have for other things supersede the love that we have for him. What are you willing to sacrifice at the altar of human approval? At the altar of human approval, many times we want to love on people more than we love God. Now, in verse 26 again, there is another kind of relationship that Jesus makes mention of. The first is of our families, but the second is your own self. It says towards the end of verse 26, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Friends, notice that Jesus isn't calling you to hate yourself but by comparison, he is saying that your consideration for yourself and for your needs has to be way below your consideration for Jesus, for his will, and for his purpose. Now, some of us might not have a challenge with this whole thing of love for family, but the trouble comes with love for self. Some of us are in fact willing to say, yeah, family, but self. Friends, Jesus addresses both relationships. A relationship, your love for self, 
Now he is aware that among the crowds following him, there are those that have a self-centered life where their needs come first. It is about me, myself, and I. In fact, it is possible that among the crowds, there are those that are saying, let me follow him so that in the event that we enter into this kingdom and conquer and become the people in charge, I will probably have some small government position somewhere, self-seeking. But it is also possible that there could be those among us here that are simply running after Jesus because there is something we want him to do for us. I want him to do something for me, self, my needs. There is this need I want him to meet and it comes first. Friends, Jesus is telling us for us to be disciples fashioned after his own heart, we ought to be those that look not at our own needs first. We ought to be those that live a Christ-centered life. So much so that we we do not need to think about our own lives, but rather the life that Christ has called us to. There is a passage in scripture that says, if you so much treasure your life, you lose it. But if you give it out in service of the Lord, somehow you gain it. So the call for disciples, you and I this afternoon, is to be those that yes, love our families, that yeah, yes, love ourselves, but not those that let these two loves blind us from actually doing what Jesus wants us to do. Friends, in verse 27, Jesus makes it a bit more uh, disturbing. He says, and anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. He clearly tells us that the life lived in following him is one of self-sacrifice. There must be something that you sacrifice of yourself in light of following Jesus. In Luganda, we say, Wali mutango, there must be a cost. Praise the Lord. And this cost is carrying your cross. Now, I know the cross is heavy. It is not light. Leave alone this that we usually carry on the way of the cross and just, eh? The cross do those days was a difficult burden to bear. So Jesus is telling us there must be that place of self-sacrifice for you to follow me. If you are not willing to bear that, that, that cross, then you cannot be my disciple. But the beauty is, in as much as there is that call, it is interesting for us to note that we do this not in our own strength. Friends, we cannot fully follow Jesus as per his terms in our own strength. And that is why we need the Holy Spirit to enable us. I know some of us follow, some of us come to church, and for us coming to church every Sunday is probably an indicator of uh, being disciples. Some of us uh, engage in religious things, and we, we are told, sit up, stand, sit up, stand, and we think that is costly enough for us to be counted as disciples. There is that human effort we put in. There is that religiosity. Friends, a time comes and you just feel you cannot go anymore. You need the Holy Spirit to help us. We need to yield to him to help us be disciples of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 to 10. And he is talking about how the Lord's grace is sufficient and how many times in our weakness, when we feel like we cannot hold on to any more being disciples, he remembers, you know what? When I am weak, then I know I am strong because God is there to uphold my hand to help me keep on keeping on. Now, Paul acknowledges he isn't strong enough. And the same should be true for you and I. We cannot run this race of being faithful disciples alone. We will get somewhere and get tired. 
but remembering that Jesus is there and that his grace is sufficient will go a long way in helping us be faithful disciples. In this passage, Paul is indirectly telling each one of us to humble ourselves before God, ask for his grace so that he can help us be faithful disciples. So friends, whether it is your own self that is seemingly difficult for you to let go of to follow Jesus, whether you are struggling with family and you are not sure if family should be put below your love for Jesus, the call is for us not to give way but to daily depend on God for enablement. Now this is strange but there are some of us that come from families where our own family members are that particular hindrance to us coming to Jesus and to following him. I know of a friend those days in Chambogo who was our mama in Kakumba. She was leading prime time then, so, on, so much on fire for the Lord, fire spitting, demon chasing, a good worshiper. A time came, we prayed for a husband. The husband seemed to be taking long until this haji came from old Kampala. Those days, it was a strategy to come and actually depopulate the kingdom of heaven. He comes, he says, you know what, me, I don't mind. You can keep going to church. Three years down the road, she started dressing like her friends. She was not coming to church. And uh, family was a hindrance to our own getting to know the Lord more. So our own families can be a hindrance to us. But Jesus calls us to denounce all that we have and all that we are could be family or our own selves for the sake of faithfully following him. Friends, being a disciple of Jesus is full of many difficult decisions and lots of hard choices. There will be choices you will need to make Difficult at that because they might be touching on family, they might be touching on self, and yet because the call is for you to be a disciple, you will have to make that difficult decision. What Jesus is doing in this passage is to help us count the cost of what it means to be his disciple. He is not forcing it down our throat. He wants us to count the cost and decide, choose whether to follow him or not to follow him. And I'm imagining as Jesus is talking, at this point the crowds are beginning to thin out. Remember, I started by saying there could have been those that are following because of excitement, because of selfish intentions. And I'm thinking at the hearing of this, some are beginning to kind of hold their steps back it is becoming serious and hot, and some are thinking, mm, my family, mm -mm. I love my husband so much that nothing can get in the way of our love. I love myself so much that these things of, of sacrificing manya for Jesus, mm, and I'm beginning to imagine the crowd is thinning out. The numbers that are pushing their footsteps ahead to follow are reducing, because at the counting of the cost, they, they are not sure they are able to bear this cost of following Jesus Christ. They could have been following because of reasons that were not genuine. But they actually begin to realize, especially those that thought the kingdom is here, the king has come, as Jesus begins to teach, they're thinking, actually this man is soon going to Jerusalem to die. I do not think I should be among the people following him. But as we read 33 towards the end, it says in the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Everything including your family, including self, could be including your career that God has given you. The call is for us to be ready to leave our families, to leave our homes, and to depend entirely on God for everything. And ask myself, why do we need to be ready? Because we've been called as the salt of the earth. He says in 34, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? 
It is neither fit for the soil nor for the manure heap. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Lord is saying. Friends, we are called as disciples in this perverse generation to be those that kind of are contrasted with salt. But if in losing our saltiness, we abandon what it means to be true disciples following after Jesus, we are not making him Lord, we will have labored for nothing. And so I want to request all of us to arise. And in reflection of what the passage is saying to us, God is calling us to re-evaluate ourselves in terms of our love for him vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the love for our families, in terms of our love for him vis-a-vis -vis our own selves, in terms of what it exactly means for us to be his followers. Have we really, really given of ourselves? Or for some of us, it could be excitement driving us like many people in this crowd that were following after Jesus. Have we done a reflection of the cost? And are we sure we can bear this cost? Do we have the Holy Spirit in us to enable us to live that life of a disciple out? Or we think in our own strength and might, we are able to help ourselves. Can I request us to go before the Lord this afternoon? Let us open our hearts and minds to him and tell him, Lord, today... I have had a reflection of what it truly means. It could be that you have been found wanting you in evaluation of your intent. It could be you are following after him for selfish intentions. It could be that there is that selfish drive that is causing you to follow him. Will you go before him and tell him, Lord, today I ask that you will have mercy upon me. Tell him, Lord, I ask that you will teach me what it exactly means to be a disciple, someone following after you. Help me have that revelation of who a true disciple is. Ask him to forgive you for the many times you, you have fronted family as an excuse, for the many times you fronted relationship with family members, for the many times you've actually not fulfilled your divine mandate because according to you, family should be priority. Ask him. He is gracious. He is gracious. He is able to help us. He is able to help us have a balanced opinion of what it means to love our families and yet love him more because he is the author of these families. He has given them to us and he desires that we serve him through these families to the glory and honor of his name. His desire is not that family will be an idol for us. His desire is that through these families, people will come to his knowledge that through these families a relationship that models the relationship that a church has with him should come through so let us go before him first of all also thank him for the gift of this family thank him that he has given you these relationships around you among whom he wants you to live your dedication to him thank him for that family thank him because in these families each one of you is able to uphold one another each one of you is able to encourage one another each one of you is able to be to mirror the image of God in these families thank him for the gift of family thank him because of that tremendous relationship and ask him to give you grace ask him to give you grace to be giving of your family for many of us, our families have been closed out of the message of salvation. For many of us, our families have been closed out on cells and fellowships. It could be that God wants you to open up your family home so that his word will be proclaimed to the people um, around you and those that live in it. It could be that God wants to use your family and yet you love it so much so that you are not willing to open it up to be used of the Lord. Friends, God has given us family for a purpose and it is to be used for his glory. Thank you, Lord, for our families. 
but also this relationship of self. Some of us love ourselves so much that we have in a way become small demigods. We are kind of small idols that our love for ourselves is so greater than the love we profess to have for God. Will you go before the Lord and ask him to have mercy? Ask him to forgive us. Ask him to forgive us for the many times we've exalted our own selves above him. Ask him to forgive us for the many times we have exalted our own self, individual needs and not the needs of the kingdom. Ask him for the many times your prayer life, your list has had only needs that are self. Me, 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 me. Lord, do this for me. Lord, my husband. Lord, my career. Lord, my son. Lord, my, my parents, Lord, everything has seemingly been you. God is reminding us that a true disciple is one that is not so much so concerned about their own individual needs. A disciple is not concerned about selfish needs. A follower of Jesus Christ is concerned about the needs of the people in the kingdom. And many times it could actually mean that your needs will come last if at all they need to appear but many times we have fronted our own needs will we go before the Lord and ask him to have mercy Lord today we have understood that yes you call us many times to even denounce ourselves denounce the needs that we think we desire for the sake of your kingdom because you have called us ask him to give you grace to depend on him and not to depend on your own individual might ask him to give you grace not to depend on your wisdom many times because of our love for our own selves. We think we have the connections we need. We think we can survive without God. Ask him to give you grace and understanding so that you will be able to depend on him alone. Disciples depend on their masters. They do not depend on their own selves. Disciples depend on their Lord. Jesus is our Lord. Ask him to give you grace to ask him to reign, to reign in every aspect of your life. It could be in those that you think are small. It could be in those that you think are big. Friends, disciples have a master. Disciples have a master. Followers have a master. And they yield themselves to that master. They depend on that master. They depend on that master for leading. Ask the Lord to indeed be your Lord. Ask him to give you the grace to yield, to abide in obedience to what he wants you to do. Ask him to give you grace. Ask him to give you grace. Ask him to give you grace. He is faithful. Disciples have a master. We have a master. We ought to let him to lead and to, 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 to give us grace to yield. Tell him, Lord, today I choose to depend on you. You are my Lord. You are my master. I follow after you. Forgive me for having being led myself ask him to forgive you friends you know there are situations many times where you have led yourself where you have led yourself in fact for some of us we have said Jesus sit here for a moment let me try and help us out many times we've let him out of the picture forgetting that as disciples the master leads the way ask him to forgive us Ask him to forgive you for the many times you have not followed after him. For the many times you followed your own desires. For the many times you followed your own interests. Ask the Lord to forgive you. Give him his rightful position this afternoon. Tell him, Lord, now I have understood. I exalt you as Lord. I exalt you as my master. And I choose to follow after your leading. I choose to yield to your leading. Ask for grace to obey. Ask for grace to obey, that when the master gives us a command, we will run with it to the right direction. Ask for grace to obey. Ask for grace to obey. Disciples obey their master. Lord, we ask for grace to obey. We ask that you will lead us, that you will give us grace to yield to your leading, to the glory and honor of your name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, King of glory. Thank you, Abba Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, King of Glory, for this reminder. Thank you for this reminder that comes to us this afternoon. And Lord, we have read in your word. You have reminded us. You have reminded us, King Jesus. 
that we need to be giving of ourselves to you. We need to be giving of our families. We need to be giving of all that you've given to us. Help us to be ready. Help us to be ready because we, we do not know the time or the hour that you will be coming back. Lord, it will be disheartening for, for us to miss out. Help us to be ready in season and out of season. Let us be disciples that are ready all the time. So that, Lord, when you come, when our time is done, you will indeed say to us, you have done me well, my faithful servants. Father, we acknowledge we cannot do all this alone. We need your Holy Spirit to help us. And so, Lord, I pray for myself as I pray for these, my brothers and sisters, that there will be a fresh infilling of your Holy Spirit. That, Lord, you will fill us to the brim. Fill us, my master, O oh God. Because the Holy Spirit is our helper. He is our comforter. He is our teacher. He reminds us daily to obey. He reminds us, so Lord, fill us once again with your Holy Spirit. And may we yield to his leading, to the glory and honor of his name. We give you thanks. We give you praise. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen, amen and amen and amen. We thank you, Lord, for that reminder. And as we plan to go out into the world, may these words keep resounding in our ears. That we are disciples that you have called. And so there is, there is a lifestyle, there is a behavior you desire of us. You have called us to love you and serve you faithfully. Give us grace to let nothing stand in our way of that. In Jesus' mighty name we pray.